So, hi. Thanks. Um, um, first of all, before I start, I want to say that uh, today was been a really inspiring and extremely interesting event. Uh, we've, I've learned a lot of new things, and I've uh, had a lot of new uh, new insights. So, thank you for that. What I want to do today is I want to talk about the implication of robotization on the future of work. And this is a very big and complex problem, um, which you can address in various ways. But I want to address it from a philosophical standpoint. Now, my name is Fabian. Uh, I live in Amsterdam, and I am a philosopher. And I also work currently in market research. And I'm a part of a collective called Me, You, and Robot, where we try to answer this uh, question. Um, I think if we talk about robotization and the influence it has on work, a lot of the narrative you hear is a narrative of conflict. You often hear the phrase as well, uh, the machines are taking over the jo our jobs, uh, robots are becoming, uh, more, are becoming better, and in a sense we are being replaced by machines. And if we dive a little bit deeper into this narrative, into this conflict, we can see that the fear of being replaced um, is grounded in a couple of things. First of all, it's grounded factually, because uh, I think, yeah, from Sherry, you already mentioned the study. Uh, there was a study by the University of Oxford where they published that, uh, or they suggested that 47% of uh, US jobs are at risk of being replaced by machines. And what struck me a lot about that was not so much the number, but the way it was phrased. I think in your presentation you said um, it was uh, are, are susceptible to being uh, replaced, but in the actual study they had a model where they uh, um, classified jobs high risk, low risk, and medium risk. And in that model and in that study you can already find this narrative again at risk of being replaced the narrative of conflict. And another one, more profoundly, I think, um, about, the, um, about the relationship we have with work is, I think what, uh, I think it was you who said it very, very good and very precise. Um, the fear that if you take away jobs, and if you replace that, and if you, then you're lost. It's identity, fear, and purpose. Jobs, at this point, are well, I think the fear, of, um, the fear of losing a job is grounded in the assumption that work is essential to us as humans. It's essential to us to flourish, it's essential to us to function, and to give purpose and meaning in our life. And this is something that's been touched upon by many philosophers, uh, most notably, I think, Karl Marx, who said that through work, we, um, we are able to realize ourselves as humans. But also from a different perspective. Also, from, if you look at the capitalist system, the way it's structured, you can see that Work is such an essential and important part that if it would go away, I think the entire system would crumble because it's depending on the wages going back into the system. Now, if we look at what is it exactly that machines or robots are better at, or what are they, um, why are they replacing us, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. The answer is they're more efficient than us. Now, we are living in a truly globalized uh, society where, at least from a production standpoint, a lot of jobs have been uh, outsourced either to cheap labor or have been fully automated. Like we see here the car plant. Uh, if we go back, we see the robots being doing all kinds of complex uh, tasks. And here we see that um, this true globalization drives efficiency. And in that regard, uh, it also drives the way we work and dictates the way we work. Now, I want, to show, uh, I want to share an anecdote, a friend of mine who uh, needed a job and he took a job at the assembly line. And uh, what he had to do is he had to sort out the defects that came out of the assembly line. Now, he showed me a video, it looked really like this old movie where you see people working on the assembly line, he had to sort out certain things. And across from him, there was a machine and that machine could do what he did faster for a longer period of time, and, and just a lot better and more precise. And that machine was turned off. So imagine he was working there, the machine was turned off, and the only reason why the machine was turned off is because at that point it was still for some reason cheaper 
for the company to pay him than to have the, ma the machine on and do maintenance. Now, what this tells us is that, well, he, he made it out now. He's living in Sydney doing great stuff, so I'm not making fun of this uh, on his behalf. But for a lot of people, this is a reality still. And I think this was, I think it was one and a half years ago when we showed you the video. Um, very possible that the machine is not working and there is no one there uh, except someone who's monitoring the system. Now, what this anecdote I think shows is that on one hand, the wage has weighed very low, but on the other hand, it shows that even in the turn off state, the robot was dictating the way he worked. Because if he would drop production or if something would happen to his numbers or to his output, then he would be fired and or at some point it would become less, uh, more cost efficient to put the machine to be on, turned on. And this is something, this dictation, this dominance of the machine, that I think is also part of the fear of being replaced. Because we are used to having a relationship of dominance with technology, and some people are feeling that we are at a tipping point here. It was the French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre who already warned us when he criticized the way that the mode of the capitalist society and the way we are structuring and simplifying work process when he said, l'homme alors la machine de la machine. So man is becoming the machine of the machine. Meaning that the system um, of machines and the robots are now not more not only more dependent on humans, but humans are being uh, be dependent on, on them. And that means that for a lot of automated and industrial work, um, we see that people are basically turned into system operators. They're operating the system, they're monitoring the system, they're only there to maintain, provide energy, and basically the machine and the system of the robots function autonomously. Now, so far I've talked about um, examples that are not really new. Uh, I've talked about the uh, industrial jobs, but we see this relationship of being dominated by machines more often in other fields. Now, we talked already today about um, in, uh, um, in healthcare, in the healthcare sector, but we're going to see it in the financial sector. In all different sectors, in all different uh, job areas, we see that people are, in fact, becoming system operators. So, what in the end will be the difference between someone operating a mechanical, a medical system, a financial <coughs> system? I think that the purposeness of jobs um, is at risk because all of our work is being turned into system operations. Now, I think if we go a little bit deeper into efficiency, we can see that what is it exactly that machines and robots are more efficient at? Um, Anthony Goldblum, I said, uh, he uses the phrase frequent or high volume tasks, uh, which means repetitive tasks. And I think if you look at what machines are basically capable of doing, they are capable of doing more and more precise and more efficient with high volume and high frequent tasks. And coincidentally, we see that a lot of businesses, a lot of companies, are um, structuring their business so that jobs and tasks are being simplified and being modified and standardized. And one part to keep up with the, global, uh, the globalized uh, efficiency demand, and on the other hand, to make jobs more easier. So we see the development of machines being more efficient at high uh, or frequent volume tasks, and jobs that are <coughs> done by humans at this point are being simpl simplified. So we're reaching a tipping point. Now, before I continue, I want to take a quick philosophical side step to the philosophy of Martin Heidegger. Uh, for those who don't know him, he was a German philosopher, most noted for his work, Design and Zeit. Really un un don't, well, if you really don't have anything to do, read it, but it's, <laughs> it's very difficult. <laughs> what you should definitely read is uh, the, es the essay he wrote, the Questions Concerning Technology. And in that essay, what he does is he tries to unravel and he questions what the essence is of technology. And he, he says that if you were to ask people what is technology, you would most likely get an answer that's either human activity or means to an end. 
And he said, well, both are part of the essence of technology. They are not the true essence of technology. The means to an end is an instrumental way of describing technology, and the human activity is an anthropological description of technology. For Heidegger, he says, technology lies in the realm of revealing. More specifically, technology, the essence of technology is revealing the truth. Now, that means that it's not something technological, but the meaning of the revealing of the truth is also something that's connected with art. The techne, which uh, the Greek word um, techne, which where technology comes from, is something that means uh, it's something poetic, it's also artistic. And he says that, well, the essence of technology is revealing, and what he wants to do is he wants to uncover and he wants to ask whether modern technology is also part of this revealing. And what he sets out to do is he argues that modern technology, which is driven by natural <laughs> science, uh, we just had a very inter interesting uh, uh, talk about what you just discussed about reductionism. Since modern technology is fueled by this reductionist perspective, he says that it's not a form of revealing, it's not a form of revealing the truth, but what it does is modern technology is a challenging and it's a putting an unreasonable burden on nature. Now, what this means is that through our through the glasses of modern technology, we frame the world and we put it and we uh, look at it from a very um, reductionist perspective. Motorcycles with a helmet, based on the calculation that, well, if I evade the bricks and go that way, the one wearing the helmet will be less, uh, will be, have less damage. But if that's the case, would that one, would that uh, motorcycle with a helmet not be punished unnecessarily for obeying the rules? Should the car go to that side and hit the one without the helmet, the motorcycle, based on the assumption of a program in a way because, well, that one's not obeying the rules anyway, so we might as well go that way. But wouldn't that disproportionately punish the motorcycle that's without the helmet? Or should it break um, and cause a chain reaction and possibly cause harm to the uh, passenger? Now, we can debate about this, what's the right thing to do, but what's important, I think, is to take away from here is that each way, each decision the car makes is a intentional and is a calculated decision. It's also an ethical decision. And for instance, if I were driving a car or any of you were driving a car, I think in that brief split second you have to make a decision. It's more or less a reaction instead of a thought out and calculated move, meaning that there is a realm of um, meaning that the self-driving car is in the realm of ethical decision making and you and I would not be. Now, wait. why is this so important? Um, it's important because we have to educate the machines. We have to program our robots to make this kind of, and make the right decision. Now let's imagine that the car here is made by Volvo and that it's somehow programmed to, at all costs, protect the passenger who's driving. What's to say that there is not a car developed by Ford that is programmed to cause the least amount of damage to everyone involved? Now, what we have here is a case of privatized ethics, where we outsource ethical decision-making to algorithms or to robots or to people that are actually designing those things. And somehow, and sometimes it's very hard to see the implications of that. Now, I think privatized ethics already sounds very bad, and I have a problem with that as well. Um, but if we just design something and let it go, it's also a good problem. So here we have a couple of examples where something is uh, being left to its own devices. Google algorithm typed in three black teens and you get mock shots, three white teens and you get uh, people... Uh, and I don't know if you know this one, the Microsoft Twitter bot, who after 24 hours got pulled the plug because, well, they became a racist, people loving sex robot, so... <laughs> so I think it's very important that we have to educate our machines, educate our robots. Um, and that's one of the projects that I've been involved in, um, this is an installation that we've built for the Dutch Design Week in Holland. Uh, it's a 
let's say, um, um, machine built like over an algorithm. So the actual product <coughs> is an algorithm, but this is the installation you build around it. And what it does is it um, it's a partner and it's a machine learning type. This is how it works. So robot asks a robot scans, for example, a um, um, something on the internet, a trending topic. It asks you a question about that, and then you go into dialogue with it. And after ping-ponging back and forth a couple of times, the robot produces an outcome. And that outcome is evaluated by a grand jury. Now, there are many ways of doing machine learning, and there are many ways of uh, tackling the problems. But I think this is something that we have, um, that we suggest, because what we want to do is we want to fully democratize a machine learning, we want to democratize ethics, and we want to democratize the way we teach robots. So, ideally, the panel, the grand jury, and the people in dialogue with it are very different people from different cultures, from different <coughs> religions, from different ages, from different sexes. Everyone should participate because, in the end, I think that only through <coughs> collaborating with robots and through teaching them in a, in a very um, in a, in a very open and social way, we can get the best outcome. So, this is uh, how it works. Basically, we wrote an essay and we analyze something, and we answer that. Now, going back to the central question. The implications of robotization on the future of work, I think what's important to take out is that to realize that we are indeed in a paradigm shift, that indeed the robots are changing. We cannot have a relationship of dominance anymore, but we have to find a more symbiotic relation. <coughs> and machines are at this point learning and we are at a crossroads and we have to really engage in machine learning and I think we have to do this in a way that everyone is part of it so that we don't outsource our ethical decision making to algorithms, to companies, but I think everyone should participate in that. Thank you for your time.